Welcome, my dear students and others who might have accidentally stumbled across this video to my chapter 9 continuing coverage on molecular geometry and bonding theories. In this video, I'm going to teach you about what hybridization actually means. So in a past video linked to in the description below, I taught you how to point at an atom and determine its hybridization, be it sp, sp2, or sp3. But what in the world does that actually mean? Well, to consider that, I want to look at carbon's neutral electron configuration which happens to be right here. And to review that subject, just look at the video in the description below. So to envision what this means, I'm gonna build up a carbon atom all the way from its nucleus. As you know, the atom's nucleus contains its neutrons and protons, and we can imagine that being like this tiny little dot here. Now, surrounding that nucleus is a 1s orbital, which contains two electrons. That's indicated by the 1s2 part of this configuration. Now, going a little bit further out, surrounding this 1s orbital and its two electrons is a larger 2s orbital that also contains two electrons, indicated by this 2s2 part of our configuration. Make sense? Now, what do we have after that? Well, we also have three individual 2p orbitals, one traversing the x-axis, one the y-axis, and one the z-axis, all 90 degrees apart from each other. They in toto contain two electrons, which I'll just arbitrarily put one in my pz orbital and one in my px orbital, I guess. My py orbital, I suppose, doesn't get any electrons. Now, I want you to look here at the molecule methane, CH4, which, as I've taught you elsewhere, has an ideal bond angle of 109.5 between that central carbon and all of the h's. Now, if I were in a situation as a carbon atom wanting to make a bond with four incoming hydrogen atoms, each of which has its single 1s orbital with one electron in it, how would I form those bonds? Well, in order to form bonds, as I taught you in a past video, those orbitals have to overlap. That is, these s orbitals for my hydrogen atoms have to overlap with some of these orbitals here around the carbon atom. Now, you'll note that the bond angle difference between all of these p orbitals is 90 degrees because they're all perpendicular to each other. So if the hydrogen atoms overlapped with each of these p orbitals, then those three hydrogen atoms would have bond angles of separation of 90 degrees, not 109.5. And then this fourth hydrogen atom would have to somehow overlap with the 2s orbital that, you know, I've kind of buried in here. In real life, it's probably larger than this, but none of that really looks ideal. It's certainly not 109.5. So what in the world are the atoms to do? Well, what happens here is the carbon hybridizes its outermost orbitals. What does that mean? Well, the word hybridize means to mix. That is to take two different things, combine them, and create a new thing that is in some ways like the things it came from, but slightly different, like a hybrid car that combines an electric car system and an internal combustion engine. Two things hybridized, combined. So the carbon atom will take its three 2p orbitals, remember it's got a px, py, and pz, and then combines them with its outermost 2s orbital. It combines all of these together, and then morphs them into four separate individual new orbitals that are called sp3 orbitals. The reason is because they were made using 1s orbital and three individual p orbitals. So we get, by combining and hybridizing these four separate orbitals, three 2ps and one 2s, four individual separate sp3 orbitals that are separated, by the way, by a perfect bond angle of 109.5. Carbon places each of its four valence electrons into those sp3 orbitals, and now the hydrogen atoms can overlap and thereby form a bond across those orbitals like this. That gives us our beautiful methane molecule whose surrounding groups are separated by the ideal bond angle of 109.5. All right, now I want you to imagine what happens with a molecule whose central carbon atom is sp2 hybridized. What's going on there? Well, for that, the carbon atom is going to take two of its 2p orbitals. In this case, I've grabbed, I guess, the px and py. And then it combines and hybridizes them with its 1-2s orbital. It then lays them out into three separate and new orbitals that are called sp2 orbitals because they were made from 1s and 2ps. These three sp2 orbitals are then laid around the central carbon atom separated by bond angles of 120. Now you'll notice that in this process, the carbon only used two of its 2p orbitals, in this case, the px and py. So what happened to its pz? Well, the pz orbital remains completely unused and goes straight up and down perpendicular to the plane of these sp2 orbitals right here. Now the carbon, of course, still has four valence electrons. It will place three of those into these sp2 orbitals and one of them up top into the remaining unhybridized p orbital. Now, as you might note, this oxygen, because it's surrounded also by three things, a lone pair, another lone pair, and a carbon, is also sp2 hybridized. So it will do the same thing with its p and s orbitals as the carbon did. Oxygen, of course, has six valence electrons because it's in column 6a of the periodic table. So it'll lay them down kind of like this, two electrons in one of its sp2 orbitals 
orbitals, two in another, and this represents each of these two lone pairs. One valence electron in this third sp2 orbital, and then another valence electron in its unhybridized p orbital that's going straight up and down perpendicular to the plane. In order to form the double bond then between this carbon and oxygen, what occurs is the central sp2 orbitals from the carbon and oxygen overlap. And when they overlap, they put their two electrons in there to form that sigma bond portion of the double bond. But what about the pi portion of that bond? Well, the pi portion of the bond is actually caused by these p orbitals leaning in towards each other as represented by this connecting line. Now this I realize looks like two separate bonds, but it's not. This whole track going all the way around is considered one pi bond and it's caused by parallel p orbitals leaning in on each other and then their electrons flowing around that circuit. That one circuit all the way around is our extra pi bond. What's left over then is the two hydrogen atoms to come in and form sigma bonds by overlapping their s orbitals with the sp2 orbitals on the carbon like that. That then is a molecular orbital depiction of our formaldehyde molecule. Isn't that neat? <laughs> Let's apply the same knowledge then to this. As you can see, this carbon being started by two things, hydrogen to its left, carbon to its right, is an sp hybridized atom. What does that mean? What it means is that the carbon takes one and only one of its 2p valence orbitals, combines and mixes it with its 2s orbital to create two new orbitals that are each called sp orbitals because they were made from 1s and 1p. Those two sp orbitals end up being laid on top of each other like that with a perfect 180 linear bond angle. What happened to the two remaining p orbitals that were not used in this hybridization, the pz and the py? Well, yeah, they're just straddling the atom's nucleus like that, all perpendicular to each other. Now, obviously, both of these carbon atoms have done that same thing because they're both sp hybridized. So they fill all of their orbitals with their four valence electrons. And then to form this carbon-carbon triple bond, they begin by overlapping their direct sp hybridized orbitals on top of each other. That is the sigma bond in the middle. And then their parallel p orbitals, the pz and the pys, all lean together and overlap with each other. Those are our pi bonds. Of course, the remaining hydrogens that are on the right and left of the molecule will then form bonds by overlapping their 1s orbitals with each carbon's sp orbital that's jutting outside the center of this molecule. That then is a molecular orbital depiction of this molecule acetylene. Isn't that great? We finish this video then with a question, which is generally stronger, a sigma bond or a pi bond and why? I'll let you, of course, answer that on your own. Thank you, my dear students and others, for watching this video. I hope it's been as fun for you as it has been for me. Until next time, please have an enjoyable rest of your day.